Right now, I'm going to talk to one of my brothers. Uh, he, I've known him for a long time. He is probably one of the most intelligent people uh, in the media. Why? He's a Buckeye. Because he's a Buckeye. Okay, he's the a Buckeye. On me he's here, a Buckeye. Michael. There we go. Hey, no, I listen. It's no, you don't even have to. You don't have to prove your intelligence, uh, uh, Albert Breer. All you have to say is, you know, a couple of nice things about Ohio State, and then you live up. Good. You live up to the good. intro. That's it. They, they looked That's pretty it, impressive you know? when they put their foot on the on the accelerator on Saturday, didn't they? Yeah, you that know, was eight, that, that I, was that. They looked like crap for three quarters, but that was like eight magical moments of eight magical minutes of football there. And I tell you, we're going to talk about. You know, Bert, we're going to talk about this another time, but I'm, I just want to point this out right now. We all know that school up north, <laughs> maize and blue. We know the historical rivalry that exists there. But there's always somebody in the neighborhood who just talks a little bit too much trash, <laughs> a little too much trash for what they've accomplished. And that's Penn, yeah. like quietly Penn State's annoying. Like, oh, I, yeah. you know, you know they're, they're annoying. So you never, they'll never rise to the level of Michigan. Uh, you know, Michigan uh, category by itself. But Penn State, I, I want I want more beatdowns of Penn State because they just, y'all a little too mouthy, not showing enough humility. I want, you know, I want you to kiss the rings, the multiple rings. Okay, you're not, you're not the Penn State of yesteryear. Nice program, nice program. Yeah. We let y'all into the big, we let y'all into the Big Ten. We, you know, couple, uh, cu you know, a couple decades ago, we let y'all in. Have some respect. Kind of interesting Ohio how State. Marvin Harrison Jr. had to leave Pennsylvania for college, isn't it? Of course, of course he did. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, we, we're so obnoxious, and I love it. I love it. this is what we do on every other Friday or so. We just kind of do oh. that Ohio State thing, oh. and uh, yes, we are uh, number two uh, according to the. Uh, playoff rankings, but we know what's going to happen at the end of the season. Uh, Buckeyes are going to win the national championship. All right, look, let's get to this. Uh, Bert, I want to talk to you about the commanders. We've been bringing this up all week. Yeah. I was really surprised that <clears throat> Daniel and Ty Tanya Snyder start started this exploration process, and that's the yeah. way it was worded. I thought that was interesting wording. They bring in Bank of America, securities, okay, in the process of finding a buyer. I see that story, and now I hear that Jeff Bezos and Jay Z mm -hmm. may be collaborators buying the Commanders. A, what do you think about the Commanders going up for sale potentially, and Jay Z and Jeff Bezos? Yeah, well, all right, we'll start with the Commander situation. I do think that there's been a change here. Um, you know, one of the major pieces of this, like, and this, you know, I, I think this goes back to something that Seth and Don Van Natta reported a couple of weeks ago. I, I do think, you know, Dan Snyder losing Jerry Jones' support was significant and, and a big step to getting where we are now. Um, and I did take you inside the room a couple of weeks ago at that owner's meeting, and um, it was after Jim Irsay made his comments, which was earlier in the afternoon that day, and, you know, Roger basically addressed the, you know, the 31 owners and, and the Packers president, Mark Murphy, in that special privilege session, which is just the owners and their kin, and said, please trust the process, wait for the process to play out. I promise the process will take us where we need to go. And for the other 31 owners, that was basically taken as, trust me, we're going to get to the conclusion you want to get to. And I think the way it was intended for Dan Snyder was this train is coming down the tracks and you're not going to be able to do anything to stop it. And mm. I think over the last couple of weeks as that sort of sunk in um, and as some owners have talked amongst themselves and there was a lot of talking amongst themselves at that meeting in New York, I think it's become more and more clear that whether – but by whatever method it happens, Dan Snyder is going to be out. And um, I think it's really important when you read the statement to notice how the, it differs from the two statements that he put out in October, both after the ESPN report and then after Ursay's comments, which were really defiant statements. This basically implied he was never going to sell the team. And this left wide open the possibility that he's going to sell the whole thing. I think that's what's going to wind up happening. There's going to be no shortage of bidders. Um, you know, the interesting thing, Michael, like 
The comparison I heard from multiple people over the last couple of weeks is that NFL, that the prospective buyers view this almost like, um, you know, like billionaire Americans, the Saudis viewed um, the Premier League teams 20 years ago as like a sort of distressed asset that can be built up into a much more than it is right now. And Ooh. so there are a lot of people looking to get in on this and what it could be if you could build a new stadium, you know, maybe on the RFK site in DC, what a DC Super Bowl could mean, um, you know, being able to build that brand back up into what it was before. And Jeff Bezos, I expect him to be in it. You know, the, the connection to Jay-Z makes sense. But here's the interesting twist. I was told that Daniel Snyder, unless the gap between his bid, between one bid and the next is just massive, does not want to sell to Jeff Bezos because he hates the Washington Post. So even if you're at the end, <laughs> like those old grudges oh, that Daniel Snyder has course. could affect who winds up coming in. But yeah, I mean, that's one thing that I've heard pretty consistently over the couple, last couple of weeks. Like, yes, other NFL owners would love to see Bezos in the mix and would love to see would love to have him as part of their club they think it's less complicated with amazon because he stepped down as ceo whereas when he was still running the company day to day maybe that would have been a little bit more complicated because he's a broadcast partner now that he's stepped down that's less of an issue and they've really earmarked him like is he going to be in the washington bidding or eventually the seattle bit bidding um you know but like what you hear back from a lot of people in the league now who would know is that he the Dan Snyder probably wouldn't want to sell to Jeff Bezos because of his hatred for the for the Washington Post. So let me get this straight. Um, it <laughs> takes 24 out of 32, Bert. I'm not surprised about the Washington Post. Dan, Daniel Snyder hates the media in general. Yeah, but especially the Washington Post, which has done some uh, fantastic reporting yep. on on his team and, and that workplace culture, that hostile, dysfunctional workplace culture. Mm -hmm. But there you your understanding is that 24 out of 32, that's a lot. We'll say, okay, we want yeah. Snyder out. I think that the two camps, and I think one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why Jim Mercer spoke out the way he did that day and has continued to spoke, speak out since, I think he's speaking up for a group of older school owners that take the image of the league very seriously and take um, how this reflects upon each of them very seriously. And I think that that's the group that's really been sort of driving to get Snyder out. I think more and more people that are outside of that group have joined that group over the last couple of years as things have gotten worse and worse, right? The other side of it is I think you've got some of the newer school owners that are more worried about precedent. Like, what does this mean if stuff gets out on me? Like, because now the, the precedent's out there for us voting people out. And they're worried about, like, stuff that Dan Snyder could have on them, like the skeletons they have in their own closet, and whether or not if this thing got really ugly, Dan Snyder would drag some of that stuff out. And so I think like in general, the families that are involved, the Roonies, the Maras are obviously the two, but then there are other families, the McCaskies in Chicago, the Browns in Cincinnati, Ursays, you know, now multi-generational in Indianapolis like are more worried about kind of what this means for the league globally, where maybe some of the newer owners have been looking at this more myopically. And I, I think over time, it's just gotten to the point where I don't know if they'd have the 24 votes now, but man, I think they'd be getting close if they don't, <laughs> you know, like it just, mm. it feels like, I mean, I had an owner tell me the other day, you know, I said, so, so-and-so, so Jerry wants him out. And the, the response was, we all want him out. And that's probably overstating <laughs> it a little bit, but like wow. I think it's getting closer to that. All right, uh, let, let's talk some football here. There have been so many surprising storylines this year. Philadelphia 8-0 is one surprise, but another surprise, and we'll see if they can kind of continue this stretch this weekend. The Seattle Seahawks in first yep. place in the NFC West. Uh, led by their quarterback, Geno Smith. I want you to listen to a quote from Geno, and then we'll okay. come back and talk about something else with the Seahawks. Here's Geno Smith. I'm grateful to have worked myself into this position. Um, also, knowing who I am, um, I'm very set in who I am. I know exactly who I am and what I can do. And so I've never uh, bought into the narratives that have been out there. I didn't just get this good over you know, the course of one offseason. So um, you know, I think that's mostly a narrative, and a lot of this stuff is media-driven. 
Now, I don't know about mm -hmm. the media driven part, uh, Gino, but <laughs> you know, Gino Smith, Gino Smith is having uh, a terrific season. Fantastic. But I think we have, but, but you know what, Bert? I think the problem, and I've fallen for this, and I've heard a lot of people really focus on Gino. Great story. Career backup, now mm -hmm. playing like a true QB1. But I look at Seattle. We go from talking about Dan Snyder to John Schneider. And man, what a draft class. Bert, oh, man. What yeah. a draft class. And they crushed what, it. That's why those, they're in first place, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it look, like Gino's a great story. It was interesting talking to Pete about this like a, a couple weeks ago, too. And like he brought up stories in the past, like, and th these are big names, like Rich Gannon, Steve Young, is guys who kind of had this lull in the middle of their careers and then bounced back later on. And so he has like, I mean, decades of experience to draw back on and say, yeah, it hasn't happened recently like this, but there is evidence that this can happen. So I think that like being in that environment has been great for Gino and obviously he's played great, but you're right. Like it, it, it sort of takes you back to how those great teams were built in the first place. And those Seahawk teams were built on the 10 draft with Earl Thomas and Russell Okung and Golden Tate. The 11 draft, I believe that's when they got Chancellor. It's when they got Sherman. Um, the 12 draft, they got Wagner and Russell. Um, that was the foundation. And they've slumped a bunch since then in the draft. To get six guys that are all starting, <laughs> you know, in one draft class, that's not just crazy. starting, but winning. It's both Thriving, starting tackles. Yeah. Both starting tackles, right? Cross and Lucas. It's two starting corners of the three that are out there mostly. <laughs> Give me a break. Kobe Come Bryant on. And Tariq Woolen. It's a starting edge rusher in um, in Boy Mafe. And it's their like workhorse tailback now in Kenneth Walker. Six guys, Michael, and six guys that are playing important roles for them. Um, this is like, I mean, honestly, it's it's not easy to pull that off. But that's how you turn it around. You know what I mean? Like, and now, like, you think about this for them, they've got those guys cheap for the next three years. You know what I mean? Like, I, like now, like, you're really operating from a position of strength. And oh, by the way, they have Denver's first and second round pick next year. Those could be high picks. Yeah. And, and you know what? And, and Bert, I know it's the easy answer when you look at the, I mentioned the 8 0 Eagles. So, so the easy answer is, Hey, Howie Roseman is the executive of the year mm -hmm. and he's got a strong case team hasn't lost. He, he's the one who drafted Jalen Hurts. He just he just traded for Robert Quinn. Uh, he's the one who, who brought in AJ Brown. I mean, he's made some really good moves. I mean, the left tackle they plucked it, out of Australia, Jordan Maitai. Yeah. Maitai being I mean, like, come they on. Did, yeah, but but if you look at if you look at Seattle between the Russell trade, what they got back in that trade. Yeah, how they use the assets, how they stuck by Geno Smith, and if they finish, I, you know, and I know it's early. Hey, hell, they may lose to the Cardinals uh, on Sunday. I don't think so. My bet your money coming up. Uh, I don't think they'll lose to the Cardinals. But let's say they they finish twelve and five, or eleven and six, and they win a division at eleven and six. It's not undefeated. It's not Eagles terrific. But I'm sorry, you got to give John Schneider a look there if they win this division, I don't mean, you? Yeah, and we came out like, I mean, you know, you look at where they were coming into this year. I, Michael, I'll, I'll, I'll fully admit, like I thought they were going to be one of the worst teams in football. <laughs> I really did. Like I, I, yeah, me too. I looked at yep. them and I thought like, this is going to be, this is going to be a team that's going to be in play for, you know, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Will Levis, right? Like that's what I thought. Like, and that, oh, well, that's how they're going to replace Russell Wilson. And, you know, to do this and have faith in Geno Smith. I mean, remember with Geno, yeah, they traded for Drew Locke, but Geno was like wire to wire, like first team quarterback, like through the spring and summer, like they did see something and continue to bring him back and then give him all those reps. Like they saw something over the last couple of years there and then to draft the way that they drafted and like, you know, I, to, to, to rework some of the coaching staff the way they did with Clint Hurt as their defensive coordinator now and Shane Waldron now in his second year as offensive coordinator. Um, I, again, it's like a, it's, it's a, it's a, a management team with, with Schneider and Carroll that had gone through a little bit of a slump and now you see them bounce back. And the great thing about it to me too is like, it's a general manager acknowledging like, 
here's what my coach needs like a workhorse tailback like kenneth walker the big long corners that they had back in the day right Tariq will and six foot three um you know they need edge rushers boy mafe they get him they needed tackles offensive line had been an issue forever boom they get two tackles who both by the way are coming from like a mike leach system so they had to like project both of those guys it's I, they did a fantastic job this off season and then to leverage the asset with Russell Wilson, like to know when was, when, 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 like when's the time to kind of cut bait. When's the time to walk away from a franchise quarterback? Cause it looks like they nailed that one too. And that's not a small thing, yeah. you know, like you give Howie credit, how he knew when it was time to walk away from Carson Wentz and got that one right and and got something valuable in return. I think you can probably say the same thing now for John Schneider, knowing when it was time to move on from Russell Wilson. So yeah, I I'm with you. I mean, those two are probably right at the top of the list, you know, along with the usual suspects, like, you know, your Brandon Bean for what he's built in Buffalo and, and Brett Veach, you know, in Kansas city for, I mean, being able to replace Tyree Kill the way he did and make the yeah. defense so much younger, there are some good candidates, but I think John Schneider would be right there at the top of the list. I got a couple more before uh, I let you go. And people, you can relax, because we already talked about our Buckeye stuff in the beginning, so we it's won't do now. it at the end. I don't think we'll do it at the end. I don't think so, but uh, I'm not I, I want to ask you but... about the... I, I want to talk, uh, talk to you about uh, Los Angeles that somehow the LA Rams relocated to South Florida. Uh, they took over the spirit of the Miami Dolphins. Dolphins <laughs> going all in. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they don't have any first round picks next year. They traded for Bradley Chubb, already brought in Tyreek, gave up a, a bunch of capital for Tyreek Kill. They've already paid Bradley Chubb. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, and I hear people talking about the Dolphins, well, they can win a Super Bowl. I don't see it. How about you? You think the Dolphins are on that I level? I don't know. I mean, I just think Buffalo and Kansas City are going to be so tough to get past in the AFC. And I just, it, like that Buffalo game on Green Bay against Green Bay on Sunday. It's funny because that's not their that wasn't their A game. But to me, like that's what was so impressive about it. It's like that's what it looks like when they're screwing around and messing. Like, like when the <laughs> the foot's off the pedal in the second half. Like they still right. beat Green Bay by ten. When like Josh Allen's throwing bad picks and it looks like they're disinterested. Like, I just feel like Kansas city and Buffalo and Kansas city, obviously just as impressive the week before in San Francisco. I, like it just looks like the margin for error. Those two teams are playing with is massive. So I think it's going to be tough for anybody in the AFC to compete with those two teams, to go through those two teams in January. I, I will say this though. What I like about what Miami's doing, I like your comparison to the Rams there in that if you look at where they've invested, it's not just the aggression. Look at how the, where they've invested. It's at premium positions, right? They've invested in the left tackle in Teron Armstead. They invested in a pass rusher now in Bradley Chubb. They invested in a corner in Xavier and Howard. They invested in receivers in Waddle and Hill. And, of course, they've invested in the quarterback and taking Tua Tungavaloa fifth overall. So if you look at it, it's like now they've got their core and, like, they know what they're building around for the next five years. And yeah, it's left them a little short on draft picks next year and everything else. And that's part of the deal, but now they don't need to go hunting for like the Kingmaker pass rusher or the number one corner or the number, they've got all of that. So now what are they going to be doing in the draft and free agency next year? Looking for guards, looking for defensive tackles, looking for off ball line back, right? Like that's what they're going to be looking for. They've got the mm. premium positions taken care of now. So I don't think they're quite to the Kansas city or Buffalo's level yet, but I think they're in a position where they've got a core they can compete with for the next five years. Um, they know what they've got to take care of outside of that. And it's not going to be as ex expensive as what they just did. And this is going to give them the clearest view of who their quarterback is too. They've got a big decision to make coming down the line in Tua Tunga Velo and whether or not to give him the sort of contract that Josh Allen got in Buffalo, that Patrick Mahomes got in Kansas City. There's no better way to get a clear view of who your quarterback is than to build around him this way. Yeah, it's, it's going to sound like I'm hating uh, on Tunga Vailoa. Even when I watch that B-roll, man, you know, B-roll is supposed to, that's supposed to be your highlights. <laughs> Even when I watch his highlights, I don't love his throws. I just don't. I, I don't love it. So you want Tom? Like, do you want you, you want Tom and my? You want Tom going a little south next year? Oh, going down. No, I no, 75. no. <laughs> no, I don't want. It, 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 not necessarily Tom. 
But we're going to talk about him next, and we're going to get out of here. Um, but it's like coming back. The receivers are coming back to the ball. I see Tyreek waiting for it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like waiting for the baton on the relay when your guy is like, come on. Let's get here. Let's get here. Let's get here. Let, 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 watch this. Watch this. I, watch I, Tyreek. Look, 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 look at this. Right, right. Okay, you're right. Wait you're for right. it. Okay, Wait but like, look at the score there. <laughs> Like I do think yeah. playing from behind, like like we're seeing some things from him on third and long and playing from behind that we haven't seen before at an NFL. This one too. Level. Watch this throw too. Here it is. Watch All right, it. Here we go. All right. Oh I mean, yeah. Come, not great. Not great. So that that that's the now type of play is, where Tyreek was like 15 yards. Behind. That one's a nice one. That one's right yeah. That's a nice there. one. That's a nice ball. Yeah. Good ball. I do think like you get glimpses though. Like one thing I think watching two of the last few weeks, you're sort of noticing. Like you're starting to see the fast instinctive play that you saw at Alabama. And to me, like two of his best was like, you saw a guy who was like the ultimate point guard when he was at Bama. It was like, boom, boom. I see it falls out and it's in the playmaker's hands. And he's throwing there to Judy and to Waddle and to Ruggs and to all those guys, Devonte Smith. And those guys are making plays for him. And that's what Miami needs him to be. And I think we're seeing signs that he can be that guy at the NFL level, which to me is like good team building by Chris Greer, their general manager and like recognizing what your quarterback is and then trying to build around him accordingly. All right. Last one, Bert, uh, Tom Brady, they got, they got the, uh, the Rams this week. And I feel like this is the way I look at it. If the bucks lose this game, they can survive it. Cause they play in the NFC South. If the Rams lose this game, it's not just the division that they play. And not, I mean, not great. Seattle leading the division yeah. by a couple of games over the Rams. But I don't think the Rams are that good. Like the Rams have yeah. some major, they've got major problems. So would you look at this and say the Rams are more desperate than the Buccaneers in this game? Um, yes, I, I think that's probably right. I think the problem with the Bucks, like you wonder how much better the Bucks are going to get. And I just, this isn't even just Tom. Like it feels like they look old. They look slow, you know? And I think that there's some, <laughs> yeah, things they do. That, I mean, just overall, like, I don't know that Mike Evans looks quite the same, to be honest. Godwin's obviously coming back from the injury, like Donovan Smith at left tackle, Leonard Fournette. Like you look and it's just like, looks like age has caught up to him. Levante David. It's like, like, it looks like a bunch of guys got old all at once. And that's what I worry Ooh. about with the Bucks, With the Rams, that left tackle spot, man. Like, I just, I think losing Andrew Whitworth was so huge for them. And they've been able to make it make do with less of those line positions forever. But they always had left tackle. Since Sean McVay's been there, they had the left tackle spot taken care of. And I think, like, on an offensive line, like, look at the teams that have trouble at left tackle, Right. Like the Colts, look how much like the Colts invested in that offensive line and Ryan Kelly and Quentin Nelson, and Braden Smith. And it doesn't matter because they don't have the left tackle, right? You know what I mean? Like the rest crumbles yeah. because, and Matt Ryan gets the crap kicked out because they don't have the left tackle, right? And I just think like one of the issues with the Rams right now is that left tackle spot. If you don't have that taken care of, I think you're like pushing a boulder uphill on your offensive line, like Miami. All of a sudden, they're okay because they went and signed Teron Armstead. You know what I mean? The offensive line was an issue for him the last three or four years. They signed Teron Armstead from New Orleans. All of a sudden, it's not a problem anymore. You know, so I there's not somebody. I don't think there's somebody on on the Rams roster. And God bless Joe Note Boom. I think he's an, he was a good player when he was playing guard for them. I just like that offensive line issue. I'm not sure they're going to be able to get past it. And I think from there, you know, you kind of look: are they good enough defensively? Yeah, I, I just I'm not I I'm not I'm with you. Like I just don't think they have the same mix that they had before. And I, I think now, I mean, Michael, wouldn't you say third best team in that division? Like it's pretty clear, right? Which is crazy Ooh. to think. Wow. Wow. But <laughs> it's pretty good. It's sort of where they I'll are. I say it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll say and and Bert, always appreciate the time, but clearly I can't believe you don't understand why Mike Evans doesn't look the same because they're writing down. Here we are. Here's my little notepad writing down your number for golf with the officials. <laughs> We're talking about golf. I'm just, his I'm writing buddy this that, down. Right? Buddy. This is a, this is a, hey, don't worry about this. And it's not an autograph. This is just my trusty little. I, I'll tell you what, I uh, wish I could write. This my is my peacock notepad. 
I, I wish I could write my number down as fast as Mike Evans wrote down his number. You see how fast he did that? Yeah. It was pretty quick. Oh, that's right. Yeah, golf. We're talking about yeah. golf. Anyway, Bert, always appreciate you, man. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, you know, you know how we end this. Go Buckeyes, baby. Go, Go Buckeyes. Go I can't Bucks. wait. I yep. can't wait until they come to Columbus. Come to the horseshoe. The horseshoe Three right weeks. behind you. Come to the horseshoe. They, they've come gotten down. awfully chesty too, Michael. They've gotten awfully chesty. Yep. I think they're a little, they're a little oh, they themselves. Don't don't lose any games before then. Don't lose any games. I want them coming in. I want them nice and fat and happy and talking trash and very confident. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll take all of their we'll take all of their success because they're playing for us right now. Michigan, yeah. you're playing for us. I want mm -hmm. you to you know keep building up your record, stay in the top five. Because then we'll just take all of these. We'll take all of these with us. We appreciate you. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.